Welcome to the Velvet Book Club. Today we begin a new book, which is Restoring Sanctuary, a new operating system for trauma-informed systems of care. So this is requires in the title. Sandra Bloom and Brian Ferrier. <clears throat> Excellent. We'll just cover chapter one today, and this is going to be, by the looks of it, a very dense book. It's got a lot of citations of studies, and it has an index, unlike our last book, which is not. So anyway, hopping in. Chapter one is called, It Starts With a Dream. The idea here is that when looking to bring about significant change, and in this case, significant change in trauma-informed systems of care, helping people out, the place to start is the future. And I knew I was going to love this book because on literally on page one, they offer, a, they start defining their terms. So they say sanctuary. Restoring sanctuary is what we're doing here. What is it? And this is specifically a place <clears throat> where injured people, and all of us in one way or another have these injuries, are able to heal through the supportive care of others. Our tendencies toward violence and vengeance have been subdued, where individual and collective powers are used to bring about a better life and a better world. It's a place of joy and creative innovation, of sympathy, solace, and of transformation. Literally page one. Awesome. What chapter one is going to do, so this book, Restoring Sanctuary, is actually the third book in a trilogy. So we're going to go through the first two books just pretty briefly, and then we'll hop into like what is going to come in this book. So the book one, book one, number one, is called Creating Sanctuary, and the authors here give an account of like failed interventions throughout the 1980s and earlier, and the resolution as trauma theory uh, began to make its way into scientific literature. Trauma theory, what is that? Second definition, page five. And this deals with trauma theory is the science of understanding what happens to people who are exposed to overwhelming events. It describes a scientifically informed and complex biopsychosocial understanding of what goes wrong for human beings under conditions of overwhelming stress. Trauma theory presupposes a cause for people's difficulties, and then that cause is not in a character flaw, moral weakness, or innate malevolence, but actually the result of an injury that occurs. And this injury is especially important if it occurs in childhood, because normal development of the body, brain, and the mind is most likely derailed if there's this, these experiences early on. And one quick note on attachment, but healthy attachment, and we're gonna come back to this, between a child and their primary caregiver plays a vital role in determining healthy development and how children interact with the world around them. However, exposure to abuse, neglect, trauma, interferes with healthy brain development in children and then as they continue in adulthood. So people here are compelled, people here as in exposed to trauma, especially early on, are compelled to use whatever coping mechanisms or measures they can to survive. Over time, these measures become can become problematic like substance abuse, avoidance, aggression, anger problems. These behaviors become habitual and the more problematic the habit is for people, the more likely it will become a symptom and result in a diagnosis. And depending on which symptom people have, uh, they may be assigned to mental health services if they're considered sick or to law enforcement, criminal justice, if they're bad or evil. And there's sort of a post-ethical point here, if I can use a fancy term, which is to say that this is beyond saying, oh, people who murder, even though murder is obviously wrong, that we're not saying these people are bad people, but we're looking so if they're, they're not sick or injured, but, or sorry, they're not sick or bad, but injured. So instead of asking what's wrong with you, the question becomes what happened to you? And much like physical injury, some traumatic injuries are temporary wounds, some are more serious, and then some are actually like fully disabling or debilitating. And the idea here, this all comes from stress. And as a stress continuum, there's positive stress, which can produce short uh, produces short, short-lived physiological responses. Tolerable stress it may trigger enough of a psychosocial response and disrupt brain processes, but still not too bad. Toxic stress is prolonged and intense activations of the body's stress response, which will change how the brain develops. And then there's ultimately traumatic stress, which is an event that is ultimately overwhelming, usually life-threatening, terrifying, or horrifying in the face of feeling really helpless. And one last little vocabulary word from the first book, allostatic load, which is the wear and tear on the body and brain that can be a result of conditions like poverty, bigotry, chronic hunger, low things that are associated with low socioeconomic status. And this can have an impact on development, even in the absence of large tr capital T traumatic events, just this sort of 
pressure, constantly like a lower stress T for trauma. So the idea here is that healing from more intense levels of stress, like these traumatic and toxic stresses, began to involve so-called safety skills. Clients had to learn how to manage intense emotion in a safe and secure way. Communication and leadership skills promote fair play, mourn what is lost, and prepare for the future change, and imagining a, f imagining a future that would make all of this new learning worthwhile. And all of that whole idea there became came to be known as trauma-informed care, which is what we're looking for here. And one cool last thing from book one was that the results that the authors found sort of anecdotally in their experience and backed up by research came to be that the results that clients receive in a therapeutic environment, they, they can account for like why they have it or not. So 40% of the result comes from what the client brings to the situation. So even their willingness to want to do really well, if let's say they're super engaged, only 40% of the result right there, no matter how engaged they are. 60% came from what the helpers do or do not do within the helping environments. And then we can break that 60% down. Half of that is the ability of the helper to be empathic, warm, and non-judgmental. A quarter of that 60% or 15% of the total picture is offering hope for a better outcome. And then another 15% or a quarter of the 60 is providing an explanation for the client's difficulties and methods for resolving them. So again, telling them why something's wrong and even giving them a path is only 15% of the total result. That was book one. Book two, Destroying Sanctuary, is about organizational stress and how it's not dealt with well, or how it hasn't been dealt with well. After the first book was written, service providers began practicing sort of what was called mindless psychiatry. It was just labeling people, prescribing medication, and then behavioral management. So the book Destroying Sanctuary was written to provide a coherent framework for organizational staff and leaders to, be more, to more effectively provide trauma-informed care for their clients by becoming trauma-informed themselves. This self-awareness is a big thing. The assumption here is that all organizations are alive and they function as interconnected living systems and therefore are subject to stresses, strains, and trauma of being alive, as these are alive systems. Much time was spent looking into acute and chronic workplace stress in human service delivery systems. And this, this is a term that's going to keep coming up Human service delivery system sounds kind of cold and clinical, but this is the term that they use to describe organizations that exist to serve people with, experience, with exposure to trauma. And the idea here is the authors, if the authors were to diagnose and prescribe a solution for these systems, everyone would need to have a working knowledge of the physiobiology of trauma and adversity, what it does to individuals, particularly when it's repetitive, it occurs in early development and is a result of interpersonal violence. Two sort of mm, ideas that are going to follow in this book that were laid out, and there's the idea of parallel processes. And this is, they use this model of parallel processes when two or more systems, so that could be like an organization and a client, have significant relationships with each other, spending a lot of time, they tend to develop similar thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. So this is to describe. Uh, how, as a result of acute or chronic organizational stress, destructive processes routinely occur within and between organizations that mirror or parallel the trauma-related processes that our clients seek to help. Number two is organizational hyperarousal. And this is like just how like, chronic stress impacts an individual such that the crisis can come to feel normal. Chronic hyperarousal. Uh, the same thing can happen is observed in every component of human service delivery systems or organizations. Uh, so functioning under conditions of chronic stress, repetitive trauma, and chronic crisis, staff and administration administrators in these agencies and many helping organizations are left feeling unsafe with their clients and even with each other. Page 15. Under such conditions, helping professionals become highly reactive. Uh, so instead of, they see threat instead of opportunity, pathology instead of strength, and risk instead of reward. This is called organizational hyperarousal. So under these conditions of chronic stress, Communication within agencies tends to break down, which leads to more authoritarian leaders, which leads to punitive culture and uh, used to control employees and clients. And that's obviously not what we are seeking to do. So basically there's a tendency due to the behaviors of clients and environmental stress or difficult in the workplace for employees, this tendency is for them to develop the very symptoms and unhealthy strategies that their clients have arrived for. 
human service delivery systems become trauma organized uncannily and inadvertently replicating the very experiences that are proven to be toxic for their clients and the clients in their care. This all results in what they call sanctuary trauma. So this is like expecting a protective and caring environment and finally only more trauma and stress. Really a sad thing. That's book two, which leads us to book three, Restoring Sanctuary. And this, the purpose of this book is to lay out a practical system for changing the situation in book two at the deepest level within organizations here. And then the metaphor here is between computers and human brains. And this is something that I've sort of resisted in my own life because of this idea that the human mind is like a computer. It's like, well, what happened? What was our model before computers existed? Side point. We'll continue here. Computers have two types of software. There are foundation softwares and application software. So a foundation software is an operating system like Mac OS, Windows, Linux. These are master programs that control computers' basic functions. And then we have like application softwares or apps that can be like a photography program like Photoshop or Lightroom, a word processing like Word, and that these must be compatible with the original operating software because it works like a, for example, a Windows version of Photoshop won't work on Mac OS, right? <clears throat> and so the human operating system, like the fundamental one in human beings is healthy attachment. So loving attachment is a fundamental requirement for healthy physical, emotional, social, and moral development. Attachment is the vital connection to other human beings that originates in the mother-child bond. This is the operating system for human beings. And they think they use the term, like think of the term motherboard in a computer, not an accident, they say. We then think of trauma with respect to this metaphor of computers. And this is the idea of a computer virus. So viruses can be hard to diagnose, difficult to treat, malevolent, and contagious. I'm not sure trauma is difficult to diagnose, but the rest of it, it, it works pretty well. Trauma is analogous. A computer virus, the disruption caused by trauma can wreak havoc on many of the applications we use to adapt to our world, so like learning, emotional management, or memory even, empathy, moral judgment. So viruses and trauma in computer or in human life can interrupt specific applications only or like the functioning of the entire system depending on the intensity and then how the individual responds. And while computers have an operating system program, humans have attachment, right? Individuals and then organizations which we're talking about in this book have networks of social networks of social relationships as their operating software. And this is what we call organizational culture, which is what will be discussed for the rest of the book. Organizational culture has both conscious and unconscious elements. Last thing for today is that changing the operating system. So again, the subtitle of the book was a new operating system for trauma-informed systems of care. So the metaphor is right in the title. Uh, develop, so changing the operating system, it should be developmentally grounded and trauma-informed. So developmentally grounded means grounded in all the knowledge we now have about the complex unfolding of development and what goes on when attachment is disrupted. So, providing trauma-specific, integrative, and trauma-informed care that is developmentally grounded means changing the operating system for treatment itself, in addition to the rest of the organizational culture. Page 26, last quick thing, page 31. The explicit, the explicit assumption of the sanctuary model is, the most, <clears throat> is that most clients who present to human service delivery organizations, they're a massive term again, right? They have been exposed to significant adversity chronic stress, and frequently overwhelming trauma. Despite this exposure, they have the capacity to heal from these injuries and change the trajectories of their lives, but they frequently need help or support to do so, and they cannot heal within the context of a traumatizing or traumatized organizations that may actually create more instead of less pathology. The goal of the sanctuary model, which we're talking about here, is to facilitate the development of an organizational culture that can contain, manage, and help transform the terrible life experiences that have molded and so often deformed the clients in our care. And we're going to touch on several specific organizational culture elements in the rest of the book. We'll see you then.